Okay, so apologies for starting late today, but uh, we have mm -hmm. finally got everything under control. So, first speaker of the day is Professor Ravindran. Uh, he's director of the Institute of Life Sciences in Bhubaneswar, and he's going to speak about uh, how NOSIP. Hopefully, he'll mention, explain okay. that what that is. Mediates immunomodulation by nitric oxide. Well, uh, thanks, Sitaprab. Uh, this series of workshops is something which I have always found very interesting. Uh, interesting in more than one ways, because as somebody who is an experimental biologist, uh, the first meeting I attended from five, six years ago with one of my students was quite revealing in the sense that we were not even trying to pretend to do anything mathematical, and we just said that we will talk about the kind of science that we do, shared experimental biology. And it so happened that one of my students who joined five, six, six years ago, he, he attended this, and he took to a serious liking to mathematics and some modeling of some nature, which I honestly don't understand a great deal. but. It's something that he has done it. So at the end of two such sessions which I had attended in the past, the third one I thought I'll do talk about something that he fairly mixed the two. Uh, about 10 days ago, he gave me some data and I said, you send it to Sitapra and get it vetted before I say anything about it. But at the same time, I said, that's something that I'll talk about. But that will be only a small component of what I'm going to talk about. Much of it is experimental. And there is something which very exciting that happened with one of the molecules that we discovered. Literally, um, it's not something that happens often, even in most of the labs. We end up giving incremental addition to something that was already known. But this is something which we were far too excited about. And I'll talk about that. That's about a molecule called NOSIP and how it modulates inflammation. This is just, um, what should I say, a biologist model, uh, which is a hand waving that most biologists do. And this is not something that I have done. And this is done by a person uh, from University of Bonn. Uh, a friend and collaborator, he modeled what we had published about three years ago. So you don't have to go into the extensive details of it. What we had essentially demonstrated was there is a carbohydrate molecule that is present in nematodes, worms. And that binds to TLR4, which is a molecule that is a receptor on immune cells. Uh, I, I'm simply assuming that many of you are not so much comfortable with the jargons that I'm going to be talking about. So I will assume that I'm talking to a group of students. Um, so do uh, excuse me if I'm sounding very preliminary and elementary uh, on this. So uh, the immune cells uh, have a receptor on the surface. They are called toll-like receptors. And pathogens have a whole bunch of molecules, what are called PAMs. PAMs stand for pathogen associated molecular patterns. So apart from the specific immunity that we all develop to specific diseases, to pathogens and infectious diseases, we, the immune system also has a generic way of looking at pathogens. So a whole group of molecules which are present, a set of molecules which is present in a whole group of pathogens they're all so heavily conserved, the immune system looks at it in a broad pattern. So these are called pattern recognition receptors on the immune cells. It doesn't require uh, prior exposure. As soon as the bug comes into the system, it is able to recognize, ha, huh, this is something. So these are molecules which are known as PAMs, as I said, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So if you take a whole group of bacteria, there are thousands of them, gram-negative bacteria, they have a component called LPS or lipopolysaccharide. Gram-positive bacteria have a class of molecules called peptidoglycan or lipotechoic acid. Uh, 
regardless of which pathogen it is, these are conserved. So, the immune system looks at these conserved ones. And if you look at viruses, all viruses have a certain sequence of DNA called the CPG motifs and the immune system is able to look at that as in general. So, the innate immune system or the immune system which is not getting primed the way you vaccinate a person against a given disease is able to look at in general. So, the context in which I am talking about the model has been made is that there is a molecule on the surface of macrophages immune cells which are called TLR4 and it recognizes endotoxin or the LPS lipopolysaccharide coming from the gram negative bacteria. So, when people get gram negative infections under normal circumstances the immune system recognizes LPS or the lipopolysaccharide and responds in a certain manner to contain the bug. But there are instances where the very same set of molecules that allow them to contain the bug can actually go out of hand and you get an uncontrolled activation which we broadly call inflammation. So, this is a common term that many of you would have heard. Uh, inflammation is a situation where there is an uncontrolled situation. Inflammation is something that most of us are dealing with under general conditions, but there are certain diseases, certain conditions of certain diseases. Uh, what I am going to talk about is sepsis. When you get uncontrolled uh, inflammation which cannot be checked, a, normally a pathogenic infection, a gram negative or a gram positive bacterial or a viral infection slips into sepsis which is an uncontrolled one. The person gets into multi organ failure and you end up in an intensive care unit. You get into liver failure, respiratory failure, kidney failure and beyond a point it is a host response or the host reaction that is responsible for the disease not actually the bug. So, people pump in as much of antibiotics as possible, you kill the bug, but then the host response has taken such proportion that you have to manage the situation. So, that is what very broadly the disease sepsis is. Sepsis is a generic term, I will talk about it in little greater detail in about a minute. It, you can have sepsis as a consequence of bacteria A, B, virus A, B or a fungus A, B and so on and so forth. So, this is actually a host immune system driven disease. Although it is originally initiated by the bug and getting rid of the bug would still not be very helpful in figuring out and monitoring it. So, what you have to do is to do a certain management in the clinic, deal with the kidney failure with dialysis, deal with the liver failure, respiratory failure and then allow the immune system to come back to normal. It does not happen in some people and so they die. So, the molecule that we discovered in nematodes was actually a carbohydrate which was binding the one that is shown as a red, I am sorry a green one is a chitohexose. It is basically six residues of um, elementary sugar called n acetyl d glucosamine which is derived from chitin. Chitin as you know is the second largest molecule nature makes next to cellulose that plants make, the largest molecule that you find in nature is chitin. Chitin is in the exoskeleton of insects and in numbers the quantity is so much that we have such huge number quantity of chitin that is that nature makes. Chitin is nothing but long chains of N acetyl D glucosamine, so heavily cross linked it becomes water insoluble and you see it as an exocuticle. So, the best source is a crab shell, you take crab shell, simply wash it and powder it, you have clean unadulterated chitin. Okay. So, in this sugar is nothing but a short residue of six residues of N acetyl D glucosamine, chitin is poly N acetyl D glucosamine, so heavily cross linked, but this is water soluble. Apart from insects, nematodes eggs also contain chitin. So, basically this comes from the nematode egg which we figured out binds to surface of macrophages TLR4 
and competes with lipopolysaccharide that comes from bacteria. So as a consequence, there is a competitive inhibition between the two, A. B, as you see here, it also activates macrophages in a pathway which is completely different from that of LPS. So lipopolysaccharide drives macrophages <coughs> in an inflammatory pathway and induces and results in what we call sepsis. And this sugar binds to the same receptor and by doing so it competitively inhibits lipopolysaccharide and secondly it drives the macrophages in an opposite direction which is an anti-inflammatory pathway. So by two ways it actually slows down or neutralizes the LPS or the bacterial endotoxin mediated activation which results in sepsis. So we first thought here is a molecule which is a sugar which can be manufactured in large quantities and we should actually be doing something for reprogramming the monocytes or the immune cells in patients of sepsis. So can monocytes of sepsis patients be reprogrammed using the sugar was actually the primary project. We haven't gone there as yet. We are still in the process of actually doing it. But then before that, we need to understand why do we have to reprogram? Because literature talks about sepsis as a consequence of an inflammatory disorder that is driven by LPS or endotoxin that comes from gram-negative bacteria. So the perceived notion of sepsis is this. You uh, really don't have to worry a great deal about it. This is what textbooks will tell you that this is how the sequence of events happen during the course of developing sepsis. It's true in humans, there are no great animal models which mimic humans, but nonetheless there are certain models which are used experimentally. So it essentially starts with two insults. One is a pathogen, an infection that I talked about. It can be gram-negative bacteria or gram-positive bacteria. And secondly, it needs trauma. It can be an accident, it can be burn injury, it can be tissue necrosis of any kind, a massive trauma, which has nothing to do with the bug. So when you have these two happening simultaneously, that's why if you see in a road accident, a person actually gets into a trauma and then acquires the infection and slips into sepsis. So sepsis essentially requires a trauma. Towards the end of the talk, I will talk about what the immune mechanisms of these two events are. There is something common between them, but we are also trying to figure out fundamental differences between them. So when you have all of this, to begin with, you start with what is called SIRS. SIRS is simple, straightforward. There is no pathogen involved. The trauma drives a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. It is also called sterile inflammatory response syndrome. So you go through a surgical process, a four hour surgery, an open heart surgery, or a visceral surgery, for example. What happens is, you are going through a heavy phase of trauma, okay? There is so much of tissue injury, there is so much of tissue necrosis. That can also lead to SIRS. That's why post-operative patients slip into SIRS. Or it can also be a burn injury or trauma of any kind. So this phase where the pathogen is yet to come in is a simple sterile inflammation or sterile in the context of pathogen absence, that's all. There is no bug involved and it is sterile. But at the same time, clinically, it is looking very similar to sepsis. And then when there is a super infection after a sterile inflammation, one slips into sepsis. But if it stops there, it is easy to deal with. But what it eventually happens is that it moves into severe sepsis and then to shock. Shock, unfortunately, is just the opposite of severe sepsis and sepsis. Sepsis, as I said, is a huge scenario where you have high inflammation, a host response is very high. Shock is just the opposite. 
everything shuts down so much so you go into a phase of suppression immune suppression and the suppression itself is a cause for super infection with more bugs and eventually people die of septic shock so we have two scenario this is how in a linear fashion people describe sepsis you have an insult which is a trauma and then there is a phase of pro-inflammatory cytokine. Pro-inflammation means what I talked about as sepsis and severe sepsis where the host immune response, the host reaction is very, very high. And then there is a storm of cytokine molecules. Basically, when the immune system gets kicked so badly and so heavily and it produces a whole variety of molecules. Under normal circumstances, it is part of your immunity, but under circumstances where it is so high, you get what you call a cytokine storm. And then that's followed by a fairly long lasting anti-inflammatory phase during which a patient slips into shock. So one of the problems that we had was the molecule that I was talking about is um, one that will bind to TLR4 and then be an antagonist for endotoxin. That means that, will, that is something which will actually block technically the pro-inflammatory phase and hopefully the cytokine storm. If you deal with that, you have dealt with sepsis. But at the same time, the immune system itself is moving into an anti-inflammatory phase what we are trying to do with the carbohydrate molecule, which we find is competitively inhibiting this phase, can only be used provided you are interfering at this phase. And at this phase, it will actually be counterproductive because the immune system has already moved into a massive anti-inflammatory phase. So to deal with high inflammation at this stage, you will require the molecule. But unfortunately, this is an oversimplified representation of what the disease progression is. It doesn't happen as linearly as we imagine or we would like to imagine or the community likes to imagine. And we need to figure out who are the people who will require this kind of an intervention and who will not require. And you have a very short window of 24, 48 hours for somebody to slip into shock from the severe sepsis. So this 24, 48 hours, hours is arbitrary. So anybody can move into the other phase without much of a hassle. In some patients, it can actually stop there and they will recover. And once there are some who will get into this. In other words, the prognosis is actually pretty bad. If somebody gets into shock, the survival is only about 25 to 30%. But so long as somebody is at the pro-inflammatory or the sepsis phase, the survival rate is as high as 80%. So if you have a molecule that can actually neutralize this, that can only be used for those 20, 25% of the people who are unlikely to do well, and certainly there is nothing that you can do about that. So it was important for us to, at what stage we should, one should be doing the reprogramming. It's very nice to say theoretically that this will do a reprogramming, but at what stage one should be doing. So we need to understand the kinetics of it, the sequence of it, whether these two will actually be happening parallel and it is just that at one phase you see this and then a, a little later the other one dominates is something that we need to figure out and the field at large still has a problem to grapple with. That is why almost sepsis is an extraordinarily mm, important disease, even from a Western point of view. It's not uh, an infectious disease that uh, developing countries have to deal with. About 400,000 Americans die each year of sepsis in their ICU. And about 600,000 Europeans die each year of sepsis. So it is not something which is a low priority area, at least in terms of funding. It's one of the most attractive area for funding, although it is an infectious disease initiated syndrome. Yes. Yeah. Trauma and infection. So you're saying that 
trauma is not just providing a way of pathogen to enter, but it's actually doing something to the That's immune correct. state. That's correct. Right? Trauma is not just to facilitate pathogen entry. No. Um, trauma is a prerequisite for the cytokine storm to happen as a consequence of infection. For example, I get typhoid. There is no trauma involved. You will be able to demonstrate the presence of bugs in my system. You can do a blood culture. You can isolate Salmonella typhi medium. I have typhoid. I, I don't have sepsis. I don't have shock. And it can be dealt with with antibiotics. So that's why typhoid is a pretty easy disease to deal with, provided you give the right kind of antibiotics. Weakness and all of that. People dying of typhoid is literally unknown today once it is diagnosed, and it is pretty easy to diagnose these days. So that's not same as sepsis. But then the very same salmonella infection I get over a trauma and superimposed over an SIRS scenario, as there is a systemic inflammatory s syndrome, and then I get this, then this happens. And uh, salmonella typhi is a gastrointestinal bug, as actually the root of infection is only the gut. So it is not something that is happening as a consequence of trauma. It is actually true of many diseases where the root of infection need not be associated with the trauma per se. So second, even if you, as a consequence of trauma, you have secondary infection, that need not go systemic. It can still be localized. That's why a staphylococcal, you, somebody gets a huge boil, for example. Staphylococcal boil is a localized inflammation. It doesn't get into the system, but if not treated, it can get into sepsis. To begin with, because the boil opens up and you get injury, and then it becomes systemic. So that's what people are always worried about. There can always be a localized infection. It can slip into a systemic one, and sepsis is primarily when it gets systemic. There is nothing as local infection which is septic. Okay. So. Is it something to do with the like to, uh, the chronic stress or a stress threshold beyond yes. which it is going in system, systemic sepsis? Well, um, I, I, I'll give you the broad scenario under which trauma can lead. Um, towards the end of the talk, I do have a, a cartoon which tells you what happens in trauma. Um, since you have asked, I might as well talk about it. The cellular and the molecular processes that are involved in the way the immune system deals with a bug, pathogen, is actually very similar to the way we deal with injury. From an evolutionary point of view, we, uh, we have been dealing with trauma. As hunter-gatherers, we have been injuring ourselves much more than with pathogens, okay? because. Most of the pathogenic in diseases have happened as a consequence of uh, civilization over the last few thousand years, if not few hundred years. If you live as individuals where the spread of diseases between individuals is so sparse, you actually don't, we were not dying so extensively of pathogenic diseases during evolution, during the early years of our existence as a, as a species what people were dying of or seriously was primarily because of injury. We are primarily prone for injury than for pathogen evolutionarily, but not as the way that we see it today. Okay? So the immune system is eventually actually evolved to deal with injury and wound healing. So how does it happen? There are, uh, what should I say? Audaciously, intellectual work was done by a person called Polly Metzinger when about 20 years ago, she proposed what is called the danger theory. The, because traditionally, immunologists have always looked at pathogen as something foreign and the immune system deals with something foreign. And what she said was, there is nothing foreign about it because we all have so much of other bacteria, viruses in our gut and as a common, common cell flora we have. But what the immune system actually recognizes is a danger. She used the word danger, and it is being widely used even now. But what she meant was molecules that are not normally exposed to the immune system, but under certain conditions of necrosis, 
So the, there's a whole bunch of molecules that are present inside the cell. They are not exposed to the immune system. And when there is a tissue injury, a lot of these molecules come out. So in other words, what she said was, just as pathogen associated molecular patterns that I talked about in the five minutes ago, which comes from the pathogen, she said danger associated molecular patterns. So there's a whole bunch of endogenous molecules, nothing comes from outside. And these are the molecules which are recognized by the pretty much the same set of receptors and react in a manner that gives you an inflammation. So the trauma associated or the post-operative SIRS or the inflammation that you see is nothing but the body's way of recognizing the tissue injury and a whole bunch of molecules that are actually endogenously present but not freely available for the immune system to react and the injury leads to that kind of a reaction. And to answer your question, when you have sufficient levels of the tissue injury that happens, there is enough of what are now broadly classified as DAMs, danger associated molecular patterns which are all endogenous within the body. And then exogenous which is PAMs or the pathogen associated molecular patterns that come from the pathogen. So you are right in a sense, we, although we do not understand, when there is a over threshold level of both TAMs dams and pams that come together, that is when probably sepsis happens. But it is still a notion at the moment we have, we still do not know what exactly twill, twists to a stage of simply responding to injury and then tissue healing and wound healing as opposed to simply responding to a pathogen and then healing it in a way that the immune system does a good job and then a threshold where both of them are overdoing to a point you get into sepsis. Okay? Um, there are finer aspects of it which I will come to towards the end of the talk. It is 20 minutes past 10, so should I keep 11 as a deadline for myself? Is it okay? I will start structuring it in my head the way. We will eat into lunch and dinner time or tea time. Okay. So, how do we do this? As I said, we need to figure out at what stage one can interfere with the cytokine storm and pro inflammation. As I said, although the field would like to look at it as a linear event, one happening after the other, it does not happen so and we wanted certain biomarkers which are necessary to be classified to classify somebody as this or this. Once we have certain benchmark of who are the ones who need to be reprogrammed, who are the ones where reprogramming actually do will do badly. So one of the ways by which you do is you start looking at uh, the host response in this disease situation. So you have a collaboration with a clinician and you get plasma samples, blood samples from patients who are classified as sepsis, the early stage, severe sepsis, severe enough as sepsis and then shock. There are uh, well defined how robust, I am not, not sure, but there are fairly well defined clinical parameters which classify people as sepsis, severe sepsis and shock. Uh, this is called um, uh, uh, Apache score and uh, this was devised about um, 20 years ago, 17, 18 years ago, a clinician came out with certain criteria based on which you use this Apache score to classify people as sepsis and severe sepsis and particularly shock. So, and what we do is we look at a whole bunch of immune molecules. You really have to do not worry about the finer details of these molecules. Um, it is a long dobi list. This is what I have shown is even shorter than that. This is done by a bead assay. All that it requires is 50 microliter of uh, plasma of an infected patient and then uh, it is ba basically you are doing an immunoassay over a bead uh, 
uh, with specific antibodies coated against uh, each of these molecules and you are able to precisely quantify the circulating levels of this. And then what the uh, reason why you do this is we are searching for uh, a certain marker that can differentiate the two who needs to be programmed, who needs to be, who should not be reprogrammed. So there are uh, one thing very clear that what it gives you is uh, there are molecules which are very high in sepsis and they end up getting becoming low and there are inflammatory molecules and there are anti-inflammatory molecules, there are chemokines, chemokines are those which actually attract cells towards the point of injury and the site. Uh, they drive the cellular movement in the body, which goes where and in which part, it, which cell should go is all driven by these chemokines. So we wanted to get a certain pattern that can be used for deciding to program or reprogram. You can also classify by seeing who are the ones who are surviving and who are the ones who are succumbing. So you will have two sets of readouts. One is in terms of the disease severity or classified as sepsis, severe sepsis and shock. The other is you try to get a prognostic marker. Here are the features that one should have if they should be, yeah, Gautam. So the, the range seems to be very, just looking at the data from outside. Correct. There seems to be a very broad range and which is what is, we are does going to mean characterize that range Correct. at all? So this is uh, actually an exercise in futility in some ways. This is no way of act figuring out classifying people who should be or who should not be. But this is a problem for the whole field. The search for biomarker is indeed uh, a challenge in the field of sepsis. People do have a problem, forget about uh, sepsis, severe sepsis shock. If you, if somebody comes into an ICU, is there a way that we can predict so and so will survive and get over and so and so will not survive? That has been the biggest challenge. We haven't gone too far. Um, there are promising leads, but we don't have anything which is even 80% foolproof enough for us to make a prediction. Here is a guy who has come into the ICU and would go out walking. Uh, here is someone who will not go. And that robustness we are yet to reach. So from a clinical point of view, people try to classify. And our objective was in a limited sense, who are the ca uh, categories we should be reprogramming? That's all. And even there, it has not been greatly successful. But then what I'm going to talk about is what started as this ended up with something far more interesting at, and cellular and molecular. Uh, and I would possibly give it up at some point. So if you do a principal component analysis, this is to be expected, this is what you said. It is so difficult to cluster them. Um, there are such overlaps, it doesn't help you a great deal. But there is still a degree of correlation. This is just a heat map for a whole 27 or 28 uh, plex molecules that possibly instead of doing a simple straightforward, if you do a multivariate analysis, you may or may not be able to do something. Here is what uh, something which I haven't figured out. Uh, Ratnadeep did this um, partly because of the week that he spent uh, with you guys about five, six years ago when uh, he understood a few things. This is something which he did to make prediction whether it is possible pathology is related to inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. The bottom line is he used the Apache score, the clinical score and to figure out the pathway analysis and what he says is that as opposed to what people thought, the inflammatory molecules are the ones which drive the clinical severity. And he said that many of the anti-inflammatory molecules actually are simultaneously happening. So what we thought was a linear event is not so. And what drives 
the bad prognosis and what drives the severity of the disease is actually both and in other words this has thrown a bit of a spanner into our notion of using the chyta exos, the sugar for reprogramming because we would actually be ending up inducing a lot of anti-inflammatory molecules by the reprogramming and since they also seem to be playing a role in the final outcome and the severity of the disease as shown by the score. So this is where we stand as far as the sugar is concerned. To begin with it appeared to be a very promising molecule because we had this linear view in a mind that you have cytokine storm and the inflammatory phase followed by anti-inflammatory. It appears that unless otherwise you specifically do a whole bunch of anti-inflammatory molecules along with that and then you see if there is a preponderance of inflammatory molecule only they can be reprogrammed or anybody can be reprogrammed but only reprogramming re them will be useful. Uh, the clinical uh the anti-inflammatory is also contributing simultaneously to the pathology but given uh, it seems like a statistical model but yeah. given it's a statistical model you know it's uh, arguable that the pro-inflammatory set up the domino so you know right uh, on day four your course was decided correct so uh, would so you then claim that maybe you know uh, going so after the pro-inflammatory is the right approach? correct so uh, what this tells us is it's not as simple as we had originally thought. These two are happening simultaneously. We need to weigh the both together and then on a case to case basis we need to decide who are the ones who deserve or who would you would get a benefit by reprogramming and not assume the clinical categorization of sepsis, severe sepsis and shock. Shock in any case you know very well you don't need to reprogram. Even in the severe sepsis it is possible that there are some who are already going into bad prognosis as a consequence of an anti-inflammatory molecule. Yeah, so that's the part. Is mm. the anti-inflammatory merely a biomarker or is it actually contributing to the clinical uh, outcome? No, we do not know whether at the moment we are looking at it only as a requirement of a biomarker because we need a benchmark as to who should be reprogrammed. and how much of it is dynamically contributing to the disease is something which the field actually doesn't even understand. So this is exactly what I am. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, have you looked at master regulators which would uh, cause the switch from pro to anti-inflammatory as biomarkers? Uh, would they be better? I wish I understand what the master regulators are. Nobody knows what the master regulators There's are. No and the whole exercise is to look for such master regulators. And uh, we haven't found, nobody has found such regulators. And if we get a master regulator, we get a tool, we ha have a handle, and then we can deal with it. But something else that happened in the course of these events. So um, I'm going to keep the sepsis away for a while for the rest of my talk. Um, there is a certain other relationship that happened as a consequence of all of these analysis. What is that relationship? This is plasma nitrate. Uh, the next 10 minutes you are going to hear only about this. Nitric oxide, when you take an immune cell and stimulate for an inflammatory response, the whole set of molecules that I showed you, a long list of inflammatory molecules, also results and the ca cascade drives to upregulation of an important enzyme called INOS. INOS is inducible nitric oxide synthase and it is an enzyme that uses arginine, intracellular arginine as a substrate and it produces nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a highly toxic molecule. Its half life is fraction of a second. 0.0001 second is apparently what is active um, and but it is continuously produced 
and the nitric oxide was considered the molecule of the year in 1997 and it produced two major Nobel prizes uh, 10 years, 12 years ago. Um, so, the discovery of nitric oxide has made a big difference. Now, there are three types of enzymes that produce nitric oxide. There is one called NNOS, neuronal NOS in the neural tissue, which is constitutively expressed, which is not upregulated. It has a housekeeping function in the neurons. And there is a second enzyme called ENOS, endothelial NOS, in, which is present in the endothelial cells, which is lining the blood vessels all over the body. And they function uh, from a point of view of the vasodilatation, vasoconstriction and all that in the vascular biology. The third enzyme is what you see in the immune cells, what are what is called INOS or inducible nitric oxide synthase. Now, the, the constitutive level, uh, the previous two are constitutively expressed and then they are made constantly all the time as a part and parcel of the physiology of the system. But INOS is an enzyme that gets upregulated as a consequence of activation of the cell. So, when I said there is a long list of inflammatory molecules that are activated by the immune cells and then um, secreted out or internally made and retained in the cytosol. As a part of the cascade, inducible nitric oxide synthase comes and it releases nitric oxide. It uses intracellular arginine as a substrate. So, nitric oxide, what the extracellular nitric oxide that comes, since it is unstable, what you see as a, what you can score is plasma nitrite. So, you have it as nitrate and nitrite and you convert nitrate into nitrite. It is a simple elementary colorimetric assay, you can score. So, the plasma nitrite is an indicative mechanism of figuring out how much of inducible nitric oxide and nitric oxide was released in the system, okay, all over the body. So, it is just a window of the activity of nitric oxide production. So, what we found was the there is an inverse relationship uh, with some of the critical molecules which are associated with the inflammation. But unfortunately, in humans, if you had seen the original slide, people come with sepsis or severe sepsis or shock into a hospital and we do not know when exactly they started developing. So, you cannot have a dynamic sequence of patients when they come into the hospital is what you look at. But there is something else you can do in an animal model. So, you can take a mouse, a normal mouse and then inject LPS which is the most critical molecule that drives gram negative sepsis and you will get uh, endotoxemia. Pretty much it mimics not exactly the human sepsis, but you will be able to see over time what happens to these molecules. So, if you do that, what we have done here is there are you can always regulate the dose. You can have a low dose of LPS where animals will all survive and you can have a high dose where all of them will die. So, we thought we were mimicking survivors and non-survivors in human disease by taking a low and high dose and we thought we may be able to get a mechan readout to find out this is what happens for these molecules that one would go on to die and this is what would happen if the animals will have to survive. So, here we have a me means of regulating the lethal and the non-lethal dose and then we score for all these molecules. It is not uh, particularly very helpful because by and large they go parallel except that the level is different, but they are not uh, activated differently. Okay. But there is something else that shows up what we noticed in the human disease is so many of these cytokines are inversely related to nitric oxide. So, one thing is very clear whether or not the animals survive or die, the, there is a very clear inverse association between the nitric oxide induction versus inflammatory molecules. Also nitric oxide induction with anti-inflammatory molecules as we had seen earlier, even the anti-inflammatory molecules contribute significantly to the outcome of the disease. So, so this one thing that came out of this study that 
inducing nitric oxide is a critical event regardless of which way the animal goes, but it is able to down regulate all these molecules in a manner that we are yet to understand. So, traditionally nitric oxide has been found to be or assumed to be an inflammatory molecule because that is what happens in nitric oxide nitrate goes up during sepsis. So, without understanding the cause effect relationship we actually thought nitric oxide is a bad molecule in sepsis and so much so a clinical trial was actually undertaken in France about 4 years ago. There are nitric oxide inhibitors. Uh, inducible nitric oxide can be pharmacologically inhibited. Since people thought plasma nitrate is so high in sepsis, we should do the inhibition and all the rest of it. And they took aminogonadine, which is an INOS inhibitor, and a clinical trial was done. It bombed. Essentially, the placebo treated patients were doing better. So, uh, the clinical trial was truncated midway primarily because nitric oxide inhibition was doing bad to patients. People were actually doing better those who were given placebo and the clinical trial was stopped. The data that we have demonstrating an inverse association with a large number of anti-inflammatory molecules and some of the anti-inflammatory molecules with the nitric oxide actually tells us that why this clinical trial miserably failed. We should not be inhibiting inducible nitric oxide inhibitor. As a matter of fact, NO or the nitric oxide that is produced as a consequence of upregulation of INOS is beneficial. That's what it shows. So, we should actually be using NO donors to get a better effect than using INOS inhibitors. So, this is and, and now our interest is what is it that we can do to make the system high nitric oxide inducer. Because inducible nitric oxide comes up and then you have to have nitric oxide and nitric oxide has a beneficial role at least in the context of sepsis. Something else which actually has in literature which to support this. If you look at across species from mouse to man, the ability of a species to handle a high dose of endotoxin is related to its ability to make more nitric oxide. In other words, mouse the lethal dose is actually very high it is somewhere around 30 milligram per kilogram. A black 6 mouse you will be able to kill with 35 milligram per kilogram body weight. Whereas, humans are extremely susceptible uh, unless otherwise the Nazis had done a lethality study we do not have anything in literature, but uh, today if you do 2 nanogram to per kilogram body weight to a person which is actually the only level that has been done in about 2 hours time it can make you horribly sick uh, with 2 nanogram per kilogram as opposed to 35 milligram per kilogram which is required to kill a mouse. But for uh, several other species the lethal dose is known. Uh, if you see a certain hierarchy, but this is all picked up from literature uh, only the mouse and human is uh, human is basically the sepsis data and mouse is the endotoxemia data that we generate and there are others who have done it. And there are quite a few other species which come somewhere here essentially saying that if a species is able to make high level of nitric oxide it is able to tolerate endotoxin better. And this tells us that possibly making high nitride, high nitric oxide is indeed beneficial for endotoxin. But this can be tested, uh, that, is, that was just an association. So, what you can do? You can take mouse and challenge it with a dose of LPS that does not kill. The black line that you see is a wild type mouse, normal mouse injected with a sub threshold, sub lethal dose of LPS which does not kill. But if you inject L name which is an 
inducible nitric oxide uh, synthase inhibitor, they start dying badly. So, experimentally you can actually demonstrate in mouse by silencing nitric oxide pharmacologically by injecting L name, the prognosis is worse, the animals succumb. You can also do that in a mouse where the INOS gene has been knocked out. So, uh, inducible nitric oxide synthase deficient mouse, this is genetically knocked out and they breed true to themselves and inherently they are. So, obviously it also tells you that inducible nitric oxide synthase is not critically required for basic physiology. The animals live happily, they breed happily, you will get progeny and they are of course susceptible to few things, but physiologically it is not something which is detrimental to the survival of this strain. And if you ha do not have inducible nitric oxide synthase, they all die very easily with a dose of LPS or endotoxin which does not kill the wild type mouse with a normal mouse. This again tells us the critical requirement of inducible nitric oxide synthase which is essential for making nitric oxide. So, if you knock out INOS, we do badly, animal mice also do badly. What are the molecules that go up significantly in these animals with inducible nitric oxide synthase? So, this will tell us one way of finding out these are the key molecules probably are more important in an inducible nitric oxide synthase knockout mouse that is responsible for death. So, if you look at it, there is only one molecule which is significantly more in an INOS knockout inducible nit uh, IL-1 beta which is a molecule which is an inflammatory molecule which is part of an inflammasome pathway activation and many of the other molecules uh, particularly TNF which is broadly considered an inflammatory molecule is not different. So, this is just the kinetics of it. So, there is one thing which seems to make a difference. Uh, I have shown only the two molecules, but many of the other molecules if you look at pretty much the picture is very similar. So, one window of opportunity for us at the moment is possibly IL-1 beta that can make a difference, but there could be other molecules which we have not, we do not know what they are and we have not measured uh, as a part of um, the exercise. And that seems to make a difference for an inducible nitric oxide synthase knockout animal to do badly when it is challenged. And now we go back to human and mouse. Is there a difference because the mouse data tells us the INOS knockout mouse data tells us that IL-1 beta is critically required and is it possible that humans make a lot of IL-1 beta? In other words, humans are somewhat like the INOS knockout animal mouse and TNF between sp two species, but this is an in vitro data. You basically take cells, stimulate them and then score for molecules in the supernatant. The previous one I showed is plasma level. So, there is a big difference the way mouse responds to LPS and humans respond to LPS. We certainly make far more inducible uh, um, um, IL-1 beta as compared to mouse, although we make pretty comparable levels of TNF. At the same time, our levels of inducible nitric oxide synthase, the enzyme is actually no different from that of mouse. So, in other words, in we are making inducible nitric oxide synthase, but we are not making enough nitrate, nitric oxide there is something else which is actually holding the bioactivity of inducible nitric oxide synthase in humans and that is why we do not make enough nitric oxide. What is that molecule has been a challenge because we still do not know what exactly regulates INOS in literature. Okay? But what we know here is that both mouse and humans when you stimulate with LPS make comparable levels of inducible nitric oxide synthase but we make differential levels of IL-1 beta and we, when you look at nitrate, you also see that we hardly make any nitric oxide as compared to mouse. So, the nitric oxide regulates IL-1 beta, this is something which was known. So, probably since we do not make enough nitric oxide, 
the IL-1 beta goes up. So the IL, yeah, you, you had to. Yes, you can measure NO also. It will be exactly like uh, like this. Uh, humans, humans, it will be the opposite of it. Uh, humans will make absolutely no nitric oxide. Mouse will make huge amount so of nitric oxide. So the point that I'm trying to say is that we make a equal amount of inducible nitric oxide synthase when you stimulate, and we make comparable levels of TNF and several other molecules, but only nitric oxide we make very little. Humans are known to be very, very poor makers of nitric oxide. As a matter of fact, about 10 years ago, we didn't have assays good enough to an extent that people said we don't make nitric oxide at all. But actually, we make inducible nitric oxide enough, and we do make small amounts of nitric oxide, which you can today measure by finer methods, but no way comparable to mouse. And as a consequence, of not making enough nitric oxide, we make more IL-1 beta because NO is known to regulate IL-1 beta. That is very well established. Not necessarily in this context, in a broad context. So that's when we figured out in literature there is a molecule called NOSIP. NOSIP is nothing but nitric oxide synthase interacting protein. So along with inducible nitric oxide synthase, there's another molecule sitting in the cells. Immunologists had not looked at it. Neuroscience people had originally discovered this several years ago, what is called NOSIP. Nitric oxide synthase in interacting protein. It is present in the neuronal cells, and they showed that it interacts with NNOS in the neuronal cells. They also showed in endothelial cells, it interacts with ENOS. But for some strange reason, INOS is probably the most important molecule. If you look at the number of um, people working on inducible nitric oxide synthase, it will far outweigh the number of people who work with the neuroscience people who work with ENOS in neural, uh, neuronal tissue and uh, uh, in um, endothelial cells and ENOS in neuronal tissue. So our first exercise was we wanted to see whether NOSIP is something that is regulating, that is interacting with INOS and possibly regulating INOS. As a result, we make enough nitric oxide, uh, inducible nitric oxide synthase similar to mouse, but the, something else is keeping it under check as a consequence of which it is not available to interact with L-arginine, which is a substrate for uh, INOS to make enough nitric oxide. So the next exercise was to figure out whether these two molecules are interacting. So this is just to give you the sequence homology. NOSIP is extensively conserved. Starting from worms to fly to mouse to human, it's pretty similar. So it is a very ancient molecule. Uh, in terms of evolution, it has been around for millions and millions of years, starting with the lowest animals, and it is heavily conserved. It is far more conserved even than NOSIP between human and mouse, or lower animals with mouse. The first thing to look at is, are humans and mouse similar or more or different in terms of the way we synthesize NOSIP. So this is a, a simple flow cytometry readout where you look for intracellular NOSIP under steady state. You are not even stimulating anything. What you see here is almost 80, 85 percent of our immune cells constantly is making high levels of NOSIP and low levels in mouse. So in other words, even though we make mouse and human make the same levels of inducible nitric oxide synthase, we are constitutively having such high levels of NOSIP that possibly it is an interacting protein and possibly that is why we make no nitric oxide or very low nitric oxide. But it's got to be demonstrated. Uh, there's a whole series of um, ways of demonstrating it. Um, in silico, you can model the interaction between INOS and NOSIP, and you can also demonstrate 
by co-localization between in antibody to INOS and NOSIP. If they co-localize, as you see in some of the spots here, uh, one is stained for INOS, the other is stained for NOSIP, and the combined color is the yellow. So wherever you get yellow, that means they are co-localized. But co-localization has its own limitation in a three-dimensional microscopy. If there are two molecules superimposed, you will, you will think that they are interacting. It's not necessarily to be the final one, but there is something else which uh, you can also show co-localization in um, macrophage cell lines. And one of the neat assays that has now come into existence in literature in the last at least two, three years is to do what is called um, PLA or proximity ligation assay. It's very simple. There are two proteins, A and B, which you think are interacting with each other inside a cell. You probe it with two separate antibodies the way you do in a confocal microscopy, but you are not simply detecting it with a second antibody for fluorescence. The second antibody is actually linked to a fluorescently labeled oligo. So, and then you are running a PCR, if unless otherwise these two are extremely close to each other, they will not hybridize with each other and give you a completed amplified probe. In other words, if molecule A and B are extremely close together and they are interacting, their antibodies and their oligos will actually hybridize to a point that you will be able to see this kind of speckle, wherever you get the speckle is where both INOS and NOSIP are interacting with each other. You can also do a cell-free system. You can clone and express INOS and NOSIP separately, and then you do what is called SPR, uh, specific plasma resonance, where it is nothing but biophysically you are demonstrating the interaction between molecule X and molecule Y. Uh, one is uh, fixed onto a solid phase, the other one moves into uh, a liquid phase, and it gives you the protein-protein interaction between the two. So a molecule that does not interact with each other, it will go flat like this, and as soon as you inject the s molecule that interacts with the one that to which uh, the other one is insolubilized to the surface, exactly. So this is how a non-interacting one will look like, and this is how an interacting one will look like. And this also gives you, uh, the response gives you the degree of interaction. Here is where I'm going, I, I should be done in another five minutes. So we go back to the sepsis. Here is a molecule, NOSIP. We found that it is interacting with INOS, and we think that is the reason why we make less nitric oxide, although we make comparable levels of inducible nitric oxide synthase. Is there a genetic polymorphism between individuals in the NOSIP gene? I told you this is heavily conserved, so in the coding region, one does not look for differences between human beings when between a human being and a mouse is very similar, between a mouse and a fly or a worm is similar. You do not look for polymorphism, but you can look for polymorphism in regions which are not coding region. So what we did was to screen a, a whole, there are nine exons for the NOSIP gene. And these are intronic non-coding regions. And it took about four months for the, to run through the whole thing in a large number of individuals to see whether there are differences. There's one polymorphism which was detectable, eight base pair downstream of the first exon, which is a non-coding region, where a TC, TC, four bases are missing in a certain percentage of people, and which is present. So what we call insertion and deletion of this repeat. So this was something which was figured out. And then you need to find out whether this polymorphism is making a difference to the NOSIP expression. So the individual with deletion polymorphism is actually making significantly more NOSIP. In neutrophils, this is here, one group of cells in circulation. Uh, 
and also in monocytes this is another group of cells. So, both are basically phagocytes one is a um, polynucleated and this is mononucleated cells these are monocytes. In both if you have a deletion mutation you actually make more nocive. So, in other words those who make more nocive should technically be making less nitric oxide because the level of inducible nitric oxide synthesis is comparable and by virtue of making more nitric oxide genetically you are programmed to make more nitric oxide because the intronic region regulates the transcription of uh, nocive. So, it is not uh, something which is inducible steady state people with low uh, nocive are the ones who have an insertion polymorphism. And now we go back to the sepsis patients and ask the question between survivors and non survivors how does the polymorphism distribute itself. So, if you are heterozygous where one of the strands is insertion and the other is deletion and if you are a wild type it is not making a difference, but homozygous deletion have bad prognosis. The frequency occurrence of those who have the deletion genotype as a homozygous have far worse prognosis and they higher percentage of people tend to die. So, what we are trying to say is that you need to make more nitric oxide and you are genetically programmed to make less nitric oxide and as a consequence of which you have a bad prognosis and as a survivor. So, uh, I will possibly stop here um, there are a couple of more things that we can possibly talk about um, in a different context. Um, this is just the summary I will leave it at this and then take questions yes. To catch on to, but the one thing is is it possible as well that you need a robust initial pro inflammatory response to kind of attack back to health versus if your initial response is weak then you are more likely to hang around. So, this is you know definitely a strong biomarker or an indicator, but may be less useful as a therapy your take on that. Well, we would like to believe that is the way it is. So, when we did the mouse experiment with the low dose and high dose one that is non lethal and the high other is lethal that is exactly what we looked for, but if you look at the profile the kinetics you do not see such a huge difference at least in the mouse model it is a poor model of sepsis because there is no injury and uh, the pure LPS is something you are injecting. So, it is just an apology of a model, but in the absence of any other model you are left with nothing else to do. One would like to believe um, that the initial trauma because in a mouse model there is no trauma involved there is just the LPS. So, we are trying to simulate a trauma along with uh, LPS which actually a model exists which is called a cecal ligation puncture. You take a mouse surgically you open the um, peritoneum ligate the cecum puncture the cecum basically cecum has lots of bugs and close it. So, in the process of the surgical procedure you are mimicking a trauma and in the process of the bug getting into the peritoneum you are mimicking uh, a pathogen and then one looks at it. So, we are in the process of doing CLP in the INOS knockout animals to see whether in a trauma as well as pathogen mixed scenario it still does not identical is not identical to uh, human sepsis, uh, but that is the closest and currently that is what is used as quote unquote gold standard uh, whatever is the purity of gold there. So, uh, that is one thing, but there is something else which actually bothered us couple of minutes this is the fly in the ointment all of this was fine until now you have high nitric oxide ok. Good for endotoxemia sepsis you knock out inducible nitric oxide synthase bad everything is fine. So, it appeared somehow and if you have a mutation in uh, the human gene. 
that makes less of nitric uh, NOSIP, you are better off in terms of survival when you get sepsis. So, everything was fine, what we need is high nitric oxide to avoid sepsis, endotoxemia, but here is a catch. In shock, hemorrhagic shock, if you take a mouse, bleed the animal 30 percent of its blood, what you get is something very similar to trauma or you inject acetaminophen, which is nothing but paracetamol and if you inject acetaminophen, it is a liver toxic molecule, it causes massive necrosis of hepatocytes and releases a huge amount of dams, the danger associated molecular patterns. In both these models, nitric oxide is actually bad, okay. it is the opposite of endotoxemia. So, if you have a PAM induced inflammation as you see in LPS, nitric oxide is beneficial and if you have a damp induced inflammation, injury induced, it is bad. In other words, if you knock out INOS, in an INOS knockout mouse, the injury made uh, inflammation, the animal actually does better. So, here is an issue. You have inducible nitric oxide synthase being similar, NOSIP regulating nitric oxide and high nitric oxide is beneficial for pathogen induced or LPS induced endotoxemia, but the same high nitric oxide is bad for injury induced inflammation. So, in sepsis actually it is a mix of the two. So, at what level the level of injury is dominant and what level the pathogen is dominant would make a final decision whether or not the outcome is going to get better or not. So, it is far too complicated than uh, what we originally thought that if you regulate nitric oxide, you will be able to regulate inflammation. No, all you can regulate is pathogen induced inflammation or LPS induced inflammation and not uh, injury made. But there is an evolutionary question which we would uh, like to hand wave and uh, this is where I will end. Um, humans make no nitric oxide. So, was there an evolutionary requirement for us to make more nitric oxide than mouse to handle something else? I would like to tell you there is an important enzyme called uricase. We lost the ability to make uricase. There is a mutation in the gene of uric uricase as a consequence of which we accumulate uric acid and the only way we have to deal with uric acid is by excretion through uh, kidneys. So, we tend to accumulate uric acid and monosodium urate crystal uric acid is a damp. So, we are programmed for danger induced inflammation by cons as a consequence of lo losing our ability to synthesize uh, uricase. That was an evolutionary event, what actually triggered the event is something which we have no idea, but we would like to propose that our nitric oxide synthase high came up as a consequence of dealing with loss of uricase, but as it happens in every evolutionary question, there are no means of testing them. Thanks. One last, there is a whole bunch of students with whom uh, who have worked in my lab and a whole bunch of collaborators over the years. Um, I think you did hear Satyajit and Vinita in the earlier uh, in the workshop. Uh, Anna Jaj, Tushar from CCMB, Kanori from ICGB, Rick, Maria uh, have been together on board with our earlier work in the past. Uh, Akim and Sylvian of course, is somebody uh, current collaborator in uh, Pasteur Institute in Lille. Bidut is a professor of medicine, a former PhD student of mine who went back to the medical school and much of our clinical work happens because of him. And Tatoy of course, is his other clinician. There is a whole bunch of students. Uh, Ratnadeep is the one who has done most of the work that I talked about today and Pijush is the other one who did part of the work on dance. Thank you.
Um, because we are uh, kind of running sure, sure. pretty behind sh schedule, maybe I'll defer the question to the yeah. coffee. And yes. we, are, we have a, s a slight change in the program. So since coffee is outside, we thought we would have a short break now and have coffee and quickly come back. You know, let's try to come back within 15 minutes and we'll have uh, Professor Nagasimachandra's talk.